All right, this is where we left off from presentation one, uh, talking about chemical digestion in the small intestine, uh, talking about bile and pancreatic juice. <clears throat> and so when we move on, whoop, a little too much there. When we move on into the small intestine, you can see the location of both the pancreas and the gallbladder. And we will talk about the characteristics of these two organs a little bit later on, but one important note is that they share a duct, the hepatopancreatic duct. It's also just called the common duct, and that has some important ramifications if that gets blocked. <clears throat> now, the small intestine itself, anatomically designed, for absorption. Remember we've said that form follows function many times in the past. So there are three modifications that increase surface area. Because the more surface area you have, the more area that uh, you have in contact with the food, which allows more rapid uh, reabsorption. So within the individual cells, we have microvilli small projections that come up off of the plasma membrane and can absorb food. We have villi, which are finger-like structures that are bigger. They're about the size of a piece of rice. And in fact, when people have uh, um, the di dysentery and cholera, uh, just the diarrheal diseases, in very severe cases, these villi will actually start breaking off and they will have something that they refer to as rice water stool. Um, beyond that, there are lots of folds uh, all through that allow the um, tissues to, first off, using peristalsis, move food back and forth, and also adding more surface area. So if you look at this uh, picture, you get a sense of what we're talking about. We have, uh, you know, these multiple folds, these circular folds, the Polyca circularis, on these folds we have little microvilli, or villi, and you really can't see the microvilli from this image. But <clears throat> if you were to look at a single villus, what you would see is a structure like this, and here you can see all of the individual uh, simple columnar epithelium cells with little goblet cells and their own little microvilli for absorption. Now, this structure is called the lacteal, and this is an important structure. It contains a capillary bed, which allows us to absorb amino acids and carbohydrates. And those diffuse into the bloodstream here. We also have um, lacteals. And the lacteal is part of your lymphatic system. We have this because uh, lac fat doesn't absorb well into your bloodstream. Um, we've always heard oil and water don't mix, and we just could not get fat tissues to dissolve directly into the capillary bed. So we bypass that, and they get absorbed into the lymphatic system ultimately get carried to the uh, thoracic duct, get carried up and drump, dumped directly into uh, the vena cava um, just prior to reaching the heart. So a really fatty meal, you are actually putting bits of fat into your bloodstream directly. And then that has to be filtered out by the liver through a separate process than going through the portal system. Now, here's a view of some of the absorptive cells and microvilli. And again, they can absorb through osmosis, diffusion, uh, endocytosis. And if they're using endocytosis, they will pick up the foreign or the foodstuffs on this end, they will exocytose it out the other side. Once we have exited the small intestine, <clears throat> where we have had uh, the mechanical and chemical breakdown of food and the majority of the absorption occur, we go to the large intestine. 
and the large intestine is larger in diameter but shorter in length than the small intestine and it frames the abdominal cavity. Its purpose is um, largely to absorb water. Uh, we'll talk about those in a moment but it has a cecum which is a little sac-like projection right below the ileocecal valve. So there's a little pouch there. And then hanging off that, we have the appendix. And the appendix is the thing that causes a lot of problems for people. It is lymphatic tissue. And because it's lymphatic tissue, there's a chance that you're going to have a really strong immune response if you get something in there or something trapped there, which can cause an inflammation which is referred to as appendicitis, it can get so inflamed that it actually bursts. Um, this part hangs from the cecum of the uh, uh, large intestine, and we can see that here in the upcoming photo. Uh, as you can see here, we have the cecum, and here's the ileocecal valve, where food from the small intestine will enter the cecum. We have the appendix, hanging off right here. You can also see how the large intestine frames the abdominal area. We have the ascending colon, which goes upward on our right hand side. We have the transverse colon, which runs across. We have the descending colon, which goes down our left hand side. We have the sigmoid colon, and sigmoid means S. Uh, and then we have the rectum, which is a temporary storage pouch for fecal matter, and then we have the external anal sphincter. Now, there are mass movements of food that occur a couple of times a day here. Most of the time, the rectum is empty. Um, it is when the rectum fills uh, other factors that come into play, but basically the rectum fills when it is time for us to go to the bathroom. Now, the colon does consist of these portions. You should know the names of the portions, what uh, section follows what. Um, if I were to ask which part of the colon travels across the abdominal cavity, you would be able to tell me that, and so forth. Now, the <clears throat> control of the large intestine uh, occurs or defecation occurs at the anus. Um, we have an external anal sphincter which is formed by skeletal muscle that we can voluntarily control. Then we have an internal sphincter which is under involuntary control. It opens up once the rectum uh, gets the signal that it is full enough. And it is when this opens up and you get additional pressure on uh, the tissues around the external sphincter that you get the sensation that you need to go. Now, as I said before, the major purpose of the large intestine is to take out water. What we have is a rather runny mess that comes from the small intestine. So these folds and these tissues are taking up largely water. The large intestine then has no villi, so it doesn't really have that much absorptive surface. It does have goblet cells that are making mucus, which lubricates the feces so that it will pass freely. Um, thank goodness for mucus. The We have some bands of tissue, and honestly, I'm not going to ask you about the muscularis layer, and I'm not going to ask you about these pocket-like sacs called haustra. So don't worry about those. At this point, we have hit uh, the accessory organs of the digestive tract. Um, I'm going to step back here just a second and add a little bit of information uh, regarding the large intestine. <coughs> the control of the sphincters, the internal and external sphincters, uh, Full control of the external sphincter doesn't occur till a child reaches about the age of two.
prior to that, what happens is that when the rectum fills up, the um, the reflex for defecation occurs with the internal sphincter opening and the baby just poops. We lose control over time of that same external sphincter. Uh, the tone of the muscle gets weaker. The uh, nerve signal um, just isn't as strong as it used to be. And so later on in life, you can start to develop uh, incontinence. Um, added to an added factor that comes into play with that is that we absorb less fluid as we age. Our, our bodies become less efficient at the absorption process, so we have a more liquid kind of uh, feces which can force its way through, um, I guess, with a little more ease. Okay. Let's talk about the accessory organs of the digestive tract. These are structures that are not part of the tube. They are either off to the side of the tube, or they add fluid in somehow, uh, or remove things from, or process products from, um, but not part of the alimentary canal proper. Now, I'm just going to give you a brief intro to teeth, and then we will work on our next set. Um, the purpose of teeth is to chew food. We have two sets because our teeth, a, uh, our jaws enlarge enormously as we age. And so we have baby teeth, and there's only about 20 of those that are fully formed by the age of two. They actually start to dissolve as soon as they are formed because the adult teeth are underneath starting to push their way upward. The permanent teeth, or adult teeth, start replacing the baby teeth starting at about the age of six and do the bulk of it through the age of 12. Now, we still get a couple of extra teeth after all the baby teeth are gone. Those are our wisdom teeth that appear somewhere between, it says in your book, 17 and 25. <clears throat> I'll tell you that if they are not out by the age of 21, then they're not coming out and probably need to be surgically removed. These third teeth are called wisdom teeth because they come in about the time that you're supposed to gain a little bit of life wisdom. Classification of teeth in general, we have incisors, which are sort of screwdriver shaped uh, for cutting. We have canines, which are pointed and are for tearing, tearing and piercing. Then we have premolars, which allow us to grind foods and molars that also allow us to grind. And this tells me that we are um, kind of omnivores, that our bodies are de designed to eat both meat products and um, veg vegetable products. Uh, animals that are strict vegetarians have mostly molars, premolar structures. Uh, the carnivores have largely canines and incisors. So we're built for both. And at this point, we're going to stop our discussion of teeth, and we will pick up on um, regions of the tooth, uh, beginning in our next lecture.